Welcome to Job Sharing and Beyond, the future of work podcast that goes beyond the traditional nine to five. I am Karen Tischler, speaker, consultant, and host of the show, where we hear from global experts every other week to discover innovative solutions and tips on how to remain a relevant employer in the future. Hello, everybody. I am very appreciative to introduce my guest today. Ariane Virtue is one of Australia's most prominent thought leaders in the area of flexible work strategy, design and implementation. She designs and implements experiential flexible working program for blue chip global clients using best practice meets best fit methodologies fit with cutting edge content delivered with impact. She is the co-founder of Flex We Are, Australia's leading flexible workplace consultancy. Flex We Are focuses on humanizing work to increase productivity, increase health and well-being for your people and reduce operating costs. An innovative consultant, trainer and leadership advisory expert with over 20 years of experience across multiple industries in APAC, heading talent and leadership risk consulting and advisory teams to deliver complex talent issues. She understands that championing diversity to unbundle the myth and facts of what is flexible working and gives the clarity of how flexible work can solve broad business and talent issues. To create workplaces of the future, there needs to be a shift of mindset. The modern workplace and workforce has entered a new paradigm. Flexible working is the model enabling organizations to thrive and survive while they manage the transformational change of managing a hybrid workplace with a distributed workforce. Ariane would love to see work-life blend move to work-life humanization, and that is at the core of everything that she does. Welcome to the show, Ariane. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm so excited to be here. So am I to have you as my guest. And now for our listeners from around the world, could you share with them where you're calling in from and what type of special food or site is in your area? Perfect. I'm speaking to you from my living room in Sydney, Australia. Um, We're in week 11 of a very, very, very strict lockdown. So I'm incredibly fortunate enough to live by the harbour Um, and I can see the Harbour Bridge from where I live. So I actually walk across it for my exercise and I highly recommend to anyone that hasn't done it or gets the opportunity to come to Sydney one day, they do it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've never been to Australia. I definitely, it sounds, you know, I'd love to come one day. It looks, you know, and sounds such a beautiful country. It really is. We're very lucky to live here. So now, Ariane, you're the co-founder of Flex We Are and one of Australia's most prominent thought leaders in the area of flexible work strategy, design and implementation. Now, what made you start focusing on flexible work? Um, I think my career path has always just seemed to lead me to co-founding Flex We Are. So it started um, from talent and executive search through to succession planning, leadership risk management, and DNI consulting. That for the last probably eight years, I've really focused on flexible working. So it hit me um, probably 2012, 2013. Um, I knew the juggle was real when I was caring full time for my gorgeous mum and really trying to balance a full-time career in a huge corporate role. Um, I just knew I was every, I was just trying to be everything to everyone. And um, I knew there had to be a better way 
to humanise work. So FlexVR is, our purpose is very much around humanising work so people can be better at, at work, but also better at home and really thinking about doing the right work in the right place at the right time. So we can actually um, have some type of uh, life that's just not work. And I'm not ever going to talk about work-life balance. So we really focus on you know, humanizing the modern workplace to really increase the productivity, improve employee health and well-being, and really reducing operating costs. So to really un to, to assist organizations to understand the value of flexible working for people who, I mean, who would have predicted this rapid demand in of embedding enforced, I call enforced remote working <laughs> in March 2020 globally. So if we think of it like this, you know, working hours were set in the Industrial Revolution and it was eight hours to work, eight hours to sleep and then eight hours to really do everything else we needed to do and then get back to work. And all that's really happened is that working hours have got longer. Our lives have become so much more complicated. Um, and then we kind of went to 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. at our desk, you do your work and you come back tomorrow and you clock in and you clock out and you do it all over again. Um, then we kind of started asking, you know, would it be okay if I came to the office at 9.30 tomorrow because, and we had to justify that because, that then led to, okay, well, now we're going to fill out a form to work at home one day next week because, and it was still that justification of the because. Um, and then it led to organisations having a very rigid, flexible working policy. Um, so in January 2020, we were still really justifying the why for flexible working and the benefits for organisations and still trying to discuss the benefits for, for employees. And in some people's minds, it was just, it was for working mothers, I hate that expression, and women, and, you know, a privilege, and in some instances, just for slackers. And then we all know what happened, the world's largest global experience of this enforced inflexible working from our homes. And guess what, it's still going, and we're now having to justify the how and very quickly get people to actually um, understand how to use technology, how to communicate and how to collaborate. So, you know, you will work from your home, you overlay that with the homeschooling and the pressures of, a, of managing a pandemic and that lack of control of, to, to plan anything and really managing health and wellness of you and your loved one. This just isn't flexible working. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I've read, you know, like crisis working and and it's like here in um, um, British Columbia, the schools are starting next week and the universities for the very first mm. time, the, the university since March 2020. Mm. And there is so much anxiety mm. with everybody because, you know, we are looking all around the world and we are seeing what's happening with schools in particular. And, uh, you know, and the same as you described like even if the kids go to school who knows if there is a school where there is a quarantine or breakout or like it it isn't a, a sort of like a planable linear no. progression it's all over really there, there is no playbook for this <laughs> i wish there were but there is no playbook and it's different in every country in every state and in every city so absolutely. And so now, you know, when you first started flexible work, how did you define it to employers? Because I, I mean, it's such a broad term, really. And, uh, and, and did people think of it differently over the years as well? I think, I think we were still justifying that it wasn't just work from home. And whenever people you know, I would, ha I would be rolled into executive teams and board meetings and to really, you know, HR go, please, can you just go in and explain to them that it's not just working from home? And I, I used to 
use the example of I would come into these executive meetings and, you know, you can imagine, oh, God, here comes another consultant to tell us what to do. And, oh, great, just what we're looking for. And, and I would literally start and I would say, hands up who's working flexibly. And all hands would be down. And I would say, okay, did any of you make a call on your cell phone on the way to this meeting? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Did you do some emails? Did you respond to some emails? Oh, yes, yes. Did you work on the weekend? Did you not go into the office? You worked somewhere from where you had your weekend? And they go, oh, yes. And I go, you're all working flexibly because you have the tools to enable you to work flexibly. And, and how I think and how I describe flexible working, and this is pre-COVID, and I would, I would sum it up and say, just think about it like this. Where and when is the best time and place for me to deliver the best outcomes? Simple. And you would say that and they would go, oh, you know, and even look, and this was still, I had this in January 2020. And I know people think Australia is quite progressive, but at times I, I get um, quite shocked. And I went, was thrown again into an executive meeting and I said, tell me about your flexible work policy or, you know, um, is it aligned to your people strategy? Is it aligned to your business strategy? And they said, oh, well, we've got a maternity leave. So, you know, they can, they can go and have some maternity leave, you know, and come back when they want. And it was just like, okay, well, that's a legal requirement. Um, so let's just talk about what flexible work actually means for your organisation. And, you know, we kind of went from that work-life balance, which I was never a fan of because it, it, it was never right, um, to then it's become that work-life blend. So we've got no bookends. Um, we have no commute time. We have no start and finish time. And where I'd really love to see it going and, you know, hand on heart that this will happen is turning it into work-life humanization. So how can we be the best that we can be um, at home and at work? So this just isn't flexible working. I just have to get that across. This is life in lockdown. And I'm just concerned, you know, there's some organisations that will judge this current flexible working in their go forward. And look, it's been so overwhelming for leaders and for teams and individuals. And, you know, my, uh, I feel very, very sorry for CEOs trying to lead organisations through this. Um, but, you know, we've had to manage workloads, we've had to manage everything going on at home, and we've still got businesses to run and customers to serve. And, and you know, COVID has fundamentally changed the way we work, um, the way we live, and the way that we really think about that relationship between the employer and the employees. So it's accelerated organisations to, to think about you know, this new world of work and really giving us the opportunity to challenge the assumptions around sort of when and where and how and what work gets done. So people have always valued flexibility, but COVID's just made it a necessity. So I, I believe that, co that flexibility, it's no longer a privilege, but an expectation. And and it's definitely a, a whole new world of work. And I think the traditional notion of going into the office it won't exist in the way that was pre-pandemic, and those that think it will will struggle to find talent. Uh, yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. It's <laughs> and and it's so interesting because, as you know, as the title of my <laughs> podcast says, I'm a big fan of job sharing, and so I'm curious in Australia because I read in you know when I did the research about you, you had spoken about job sharing, and also. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, part-time careers, is that something that exists? And, you know, and have you noticed any, you know, trends over the years with regards to that? Yeah, I think, look, it's becoming um, much more prevalent than it was. I think mm -hmm. um, corporates really started to understand the value of part-time roles and whether that was a um, a, a mum or partner returning to work 
after um, you know having that that time with their new child, whatever the the family structure looks like. Um, but they were seeing that you know these these females that were coming back to work who who were working three days a week were the most productive, the most organized. They just came in and they got their stuff done because they knew they had to in those time frames. Um, so and it and it organizations really had to think around, you know, what is the skills and expertise that we need to run this business? And it may be a case that from we've got a limited talent pool. And I think um, they've really start to understood around how do we actually get that expertise in and whether it's from a consulting perspective, project perspective, or a part-time or a job share. Um, I had a, I had a, an, it was probably about six years ago and it was an FMCG company that I'd done some work with. And they said to me, we have got this resume for, it was a, a head of brand and marketing. And they had this resume and it was 40 years of experience within, you know, Coca-Cola and that had, you know, and they said, Ariane, look at this resume. And it was, it was literally two best friends, two females who had merged their, their CVs together. They'd merged their photo, their name and made it one person. And they went to, they applied for the role and said, I'm applying for the role. And, the, and the, I remember the recruiter saying, we have to ring and see, you know, you've got 40 years experience and you've got two university degrees and two MBAs. And, and what it was, was these two best friends who knew that they wanted to retain themselves at that level. They had so much to offer that they came into the interview and they said, you know, we've, we've both had in competing large global FMCGs as heads of marketing and brand. What we can bring for you is we've already got the relationship and partnership to work well. We're going to do two and a half days each and we're going to out, it will be literally, you'll be dealing with us. It'll be so streamlined, give us a go. And it was a formidable force of experience uh, what they could bring to the organisation because there was always that concern around from a, an organisation or from a leader's perspective, how do we match these people together to, in a job share? How do we make sure we've got the, you know, from a leader's it was always, oh, I'll be oh, managing two people and it's a, an additional FTE to me managing and another performance review as opposed to really understanding the value of what you are getting. Um, there is um, a, a fantastic pair as well that are doing within um, the Department of Premier and Cabinet in New South Wales um, government. So the Director of People and Culture, it's another job share pair who are brilliant at what they do and working out what's, what's, what's my skill, what's the best role, what's the relationship that I can make with them, that you're better to make that relationship with that, and it works well. So I think um, it is very prevalent here now, um, but it's taken a lot of a lot of um, unbundling of actually what you know. Part time work isn't just for slackers, and, and I think I think now people and, and employees have really had the opportunity to understand and had the time to find out what their why is and what's their purpose. And is it that I want to be going back into an office for 60 hours a week? And what's my passion? And what do I want to do? So I think it's going to, you know, I mean, I could talk about this with you all day, but I mean, we've got international borders shut. We've got state borders shut. So I can't even get to Melbourne if I wanted a role in Melbourne at the moment. So we are so confined. We don't have any backpackers here left anymore from a working holiday visa. We, um, we've got expats that want to come back to Australia and still can't. Um, we've had a lot of talent at senior levels who've gone back to their home countries um, because of the pandemic and they want to be mm. with their families. So we have it's it, what I call the greatest resignation is happening 
and the the war for talent is going to be absolutely horrific in the next you know six to 18 months globally yeah wow so now you know talking about the war for talent what do you think the skills are that leaders need to possess to successfully you know manage remote work and to attract you know new talent as we as we look towards sort of the future and knowing that the level of uncertainty is going to remain and we believe that the companies who will win on that hiring and retaining talent are the ones that are going to continue to infuse flexibility mm -hmm. empathy and really remove that friction from doing great work so really giving employees the choice to where and when to work their best um, and be that at home or be that in the office or be that um, and really spending time to think about what's worked and how we work together as a hybrid model, a hybrid team, so that the processes, the practices are also shift into the account of, of what this new normal is. So, you know, I've been telling organizations, you have to put your workforce first, not particularly in this current labor, but over the last 18 months, because they're finding that human capital is scarcer than financial capital. So the, the talent marketplace is not only, it, it's not only recovered, but it's now intensely hot as organizations compete for this top talent. And employees are going to be expecting much more from their employers and they will engage or they will disengage depending on if their needs are met. So they want a greater employee experience. They want to do meaning and meaningful and purposeful work that really resonates with their values. And not just because this is my space, but flexible working has become the new currency. So when it comes to attracting, retaining, so it's not just what, it, what are you offering when it comes to flexible options, but being really clear on what it actually means to your organization to work flexibly, what's the lived experience, um, and it has to be aligned to your vision and values, or you will miss out on the top talent. So it's a very, as I said, it's so competitive, the labor market, um, and you know, shortages globally, nationally, there's no mobility happening. So, um, and, and I believe, look, The pandemic has disrupted life, but we actually can't focus on just what the negatives are. So to me, the positives that are coming out of it is um, absolutely organizations are concerned about the mental health and wellness and the wellness of their people. And, and it's becoming a forefront of conversations. Whereas two years ago, you couldn't ring in and say, I actually, you know what, I don't feel okay. Um, and you can you know, have these conversations. So the pandemic, I think, is it's created an infection point where organizations need to define what they want to be, where they want to go, and they've really got to seize this moment to transform the ambiguity of opportunities across their workplace, but also their workforces. So to su succeed, you know, future of work, the time is now to change. Um, and I think of how we've had to pivot to attract and onboard new talent beyond the four walls of an office over the last 18 months and think differently how we recruit and what skills and experiences that and expertise that we need to really run the business. So, you know, we've had talent that's moved from large cities to smaller communities as a lifestyle change, and they're still delivering in their roles and business is still continuing. And, you know, we've got organizations like Canva in Australia, um, amazing what they've done. They've, they've come out this week and said, it's fully flexible. So all we expect is that you come in eight times a year and that you, can, you need to work where one of their actual mm -hmm. office mm -hmm. hubs are. Um, we've got Nike who came out last week and said, we're giving everyone one week of wellness. We're shutting corporate wellness. You, we need to do it. And then obviously Alassian, I mean, Yes, they've got the technology and they're the forefront of, of how they've, they've always talked about how they work, but they've just got team anywhere policy, which is really any location in any country, there has to be a corporate entity there because of, you know, everything right. else. But I think, you know, leaders 
to me, leaders need to um, lean into this new way of working with sort of open minds, creative thinking, and be a bit innovative. But of course, the kindness and empathy has to remain. And I think that's going to be the core skill for any leaders to be successful going forward. Yeah. And, and, you know, as you're mentioning kindness and empathy, so one of the things in North America in particular is that so many, especially female professionals, opted out because it was just too much too homeschooling, caregiving, and, and, you know, and the uncertainty on top of everything else. And so now how are these people, professionals, are going to go back? Because as it is clearly not over, for sure there is going to be a need for flexible work. But also what I wonder is how can um, companies best um, utilize the transferable skills they have learned as we're talking about, you know, empathy and kindness when they were together with their children or elderly yeah. Um, relatives mm. and have and learned a lot of new skills mm. yeah well the the first thing is there has been so much kindness and support shown not just through corporate organizations but throughout communities and neighborhoods and you know it, I hope that this remains um I, I'm so pleased to see so many organizations that are really normalizing wellness programs and mm -hmm. understanding that you know, it's okay not to be okay. Uh, I talk about, you know, we drive our cars and we drive our cars, but when it says empty, we put petrol in it. So sometimes we need to recharge ourselves. And, you know, what? remember when we used to fly and they'd say, adult needs to put on their oxygen mask first. Well, you know, to me, that's something that I hope that um, is something that re remains because everyone needs that kindness and that level of support. I always say to organisations, everyone has their, we could use a, pro, a profanity, but I won't, but everybody has stuff going on and everybody has different stuff at different stages of their lives. So we need to be able to support people and whether, you know, whether it's someone that has an ageing parent that they actually need to have some flexibility to be able to support them. It may be a case that their partner is ill. Um, it may be a case that, you know, the partner's lost the job, so therefore they need to focus much more on the career, whatever it may be. But I think, you know, women really have, and globally have taken the hit around the homeschooling, the domestic chores, the, the emotional strain of it. And I'm not generalizing, but majority have. Um, and, you know, we've had quite a lot of reports out in the last few weeks from an Australian, a lot of Australian research that is saying, you know, women are still doing, you know, 60% of the domestic care and also the homeschooling. So, you know, the, some organisations are saying, do you know what, you do what you can do. And you put in your diary when and where, where, what times that you're actually going to be having that creative thinking time or working on work, or actually that you, you're going to have to be helping with the homeschooling at this point. Um, you know, my heart breaks for the single mother with the twins that are five, six, seven, and they're trying to juggle a full-time career. So um, I think organisations um, need to start thinking about output rather than the, and outcomes, rather than the input and the clock in, clock out. So, you know, we always talk about we're all human. Some people do amazing work at midnight. Some people do amazing work at 5 a.m. So if that person's delivering in the expectations, what's expected, and they've got the clarity of what they need to do, do we really care when and where they do it if they're delivering on their role? So it is a different way of managing. It's a different way of thinking. Um, and really to be able to, to get that to leaders as opposed to I can't see them, I can't, how do I manage them because they're not, you know, in my pod in the office um, because that was the biggest thing. If you don't have trust um, 
we all most will go home and stop talking about flexible working. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and, <laughs> now, it is, you know, this is also a perfect um, segue to my next question, because you are part of the family friendly workplaces certification that was created by Emma Walsh. And so I was so curious to learn more about it. And if you could share with our listeners, what does that certification entail? Perfect. I'd love to. I'm, something I'm extremely passionate about. So in conjunction with UNICEF Australia and Parents at Work, it's driven by the amazing CEO, Emma Walsh. Um, FlexiR is, supporting, um, is a supporting partner for the Flexible Working Pillar. So what, what's been created is a national work and family, which is developed through a family-friendly workplaces program. And it's the first of its kind in Australia and really benchmarking policy and practice for more inclusive workplaces. So we launched our first cohort um, in May and it's really to provide um, employers with sort of best practice guidelines that will support their employees to meet their work and family wellbeing needs. Um, so they literally go through like a citation and then you know, it's wonderful because they get they go through a citation and then they get a report and recommendations and then they get two years of actual support through the whole process. Wow. So they, you know, they effectively what we've done, we've broken it up into six categories and mm -hmm. um, we've unbundled that it's not just for parents. And it's not just for women. Everyone is a family member. Everyone is part of a tribe, part of a family. So, um, and we don't have any, we don't have any government policies as such around these. So the categories are flexible working, parental leave, family wellbeing, family care, leadership and culture, and then measurement. So, for instance, with the the flexible work pillar, it's around, you know. Other, do they have a work practice around flexible working? Um, you know, are they embedded? Are they normalised? Are the employees supported in combining their work and family life commitments? And then, you know, making sure that it's not just about part time, it's not just job share, but it's, you know, everything around work location and hours and different forms. Um, the family wellbeing which I think particularly, I mean, we've been working, I think Emma's been working on this her whole career to get to this point as well, but I think um, the timing of it could not have been more relevant. And, you know, family wellbeing was about, you know, the employee emotional and physical wellbeing to ensure that they present their best self and home and work, but also wellbeing around financial safety, health and fitness, um, you know, healthy eating and really supporting, um, you know, including different types of leave. And it may be, you know, in the instance of domestic violence um, and family violence. So um, we're very much, we're, we're excited because we've got some global brands. So Deloitte, Microsoft, Commonwealth Bank, Novartis, um, just to name a few um, have gone through. Um, and we, so we've had probably now, I think by the time this podcast come out, we'll probably have about 50 that have actually um, gone through the citation and have been certified and have committed to this process. So, um, it, you know, it is something that I am absolutely passionate about and it made sense and we're extremely lucky to have been chosen to be part of this, but I, I would have done it in a heartbeat. Thank you so much for sharing. It sounds amazing. And, you know, as I had recently talked with um, Lola and Pilar, the co-founders mm. of Project Matriarchs, yeah. it's so interesting because it kind of, I see, it, you know, the same thing coming from different aspects, right? They are, from a student perspective, hoping that other students will pledge to work at organizations that care about caregiver. Mm. And so what you're doing is basically having a big, um, you know, an English is, I think, emblem that, yeah. you know, sort of says family-friendly organization apply here. So it, it's perfect. Absolutely. So they will, they will be brand, you know, they'll be allowed to obviously market yeah. and brand that they are and they're committed to it. 
And it's not just a report, you tick the box, you pay some money and, right, get, and right. get a tick. It, they're, they're, they will be accountable right. for what they're pledging to improve and it will be the fact that they will be supported and they'll be given experts in different fields to help them as an organisation. You know, our goal is to run this globally. Our goal is to particularly, you know, having having UNICEF, uh, which is such a, you know, it, it absolutely aligns to the brands and the values and the purpose of the right. why, um, and to get the attention, um, firstly, of the Australian government to go, hang on, there needs to be some support here. So, you know, let's hope, let's sit back and watch, and, and it's, it's not through lack of trying, I, I will tell you that. That's, that's just amazing. Now, um, so I could talk with you forever, Ariane, <laughs> but I want to make sure, is there anything that we have not covered uh, until now that you would like to share with our listeners? Look, I think there's a couple of things. Um, I think if you and I had this discussion, and I wish we had had a discussion in 2020 in January, because it would have been hilarious if you'd asked me around, what do you think the future of work would be? And where's flexible work going? And I'd still be telling you, oh, we're really trying to get organisations to understand the benefit. Um, it would have been, my, my response would have been very, very different. So imagine... Um, the technology that's been developed and how we've responded to it and how we collaborate and communicate and how work is being done. Um, I believe that, you know, people are creating their own purpose and niches rather than what corporate roles actually are defined at the moment. I think people will actually be really thinking about what's, what's, um, what's my, my why, what's my expertise and what am I passionate about? So I would just love people to lean into this next now, you know, the future of, of flexible work. So where and when is the best time and place to deliver these outcomes? Uh, I think you can see how passionate I am about humanizing work and assisting people to be the best they can be. And hopefully that empathy and kindness is a necessity for all people leaders and CEOs. And I would love it to be on every screening and interview that happens in corporate going forward yeah that i mean that that will be really wonderful and i can see your passion and i feel <laughs> you know i feel very similarly because i think it's just so important that you know that people are able to um you know have a work have a job that is fulfilling that they can do their best because it's based on like you know the environment the situation that gives them the opportunity to really use their potential so yes so absolutely yeah. and now how can people find you ariane on social media well our website which is flexvr.com we're on linkedin we're very active on instagram and facebook Great. I will be sure to put it into the show notes so people can find it there as well. It's really wonderful that you were part of my show. Thank you so much, Ariane. I feel very, very humble and I love meeting people with this absolute same passion. So it's been just a fantastic time to, to speak to you and who would think globally that we could do this so easily. <laughs> I fully agree. Well, thank you so much, Ariane. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Karen. What an insightful conversation with Ariane. Because we talked about so many topics, I thought I'll summarize and leave you with a few questions to ponder. And so I'm curious, how do you define flexible work in your organization? How has this changed pre and post pandemic? And as we talked about, the many aspects of the flexible work. And for example, as Ariane told the story about the two job sharing professionals who applied together and had 40 years of work experience, two MBAs and work experience from two competing um, organizations. Have you encountered an application like this? And if you did, could your organization 
handle that or would you miss out on that amazing talent? And then as Ariane was talking about supporting teams remotely regarding flexibility, empathy and kindness, what are you in your organization implementing to ensure that that can happen? I really liked Ariane's quote about human capital is scarcer than financial capital. And then lastly, as we were talking about the family-friendly organization certificate that she is participating in on the flexible work column of all the different types of aspects of that certification, does that exist in your country as well? And if it doesn't, have you in your own organization focused on all of these different aspects? And if not, what did you learn from Ariane's overview? And I also will be sure to put in all of the links in the show notes as we were talking about my previous episode with Lola Alistair and Pilar McDonald, co-founders of Project Matriarchs, as they are basically trying from the Gen Z's perspective to influence and push organizations to become more family friendly by pledging to only apply as a generation to organizations that really care about caregiving for its employees. If you enjoyed our episode, it would be wonderful if you could tell other people, professionals or your friends about it so we can spread more of this awareness about flexible work and how we can get to gender equality faster through it around the world. Thank you so much for listening to the show. We hope you gained valuable insights and new ideas. To keep listening to future episodes, please head over to iTunes or your favorite player and subscribe and give it a rating. We would very much appreciate a review and for you to share it on social media so more people can start innovating in how they offer employment. Until the next time, goodbye.